Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at what we call the properties of motion and then finally looking at resultant force. So properties of motion, what we mean, we're talking about an object's location, how fast it's traveling and how much its acceleration is. That's how we usually describe the motion of the object. So let's start off with speed, uh, which to define it formally, speed is the rate of change of distance traveled. So what does that actually mean? Well, what that's really telling you is if you've got a distance versus time graph, speed is the gradient of that graph. That's a more useful way of thinking about it. So quite often, distance versus time graphs are not straight line or they're non-linear. So if we're going to be able to work out speed, we need to know how to work out the gradient of graphs which are not straight lines. And the way we do that is we draw a tangent, which you can see in green on the graph. We draw a tangent to the graph at the time. So if we want to know the speed at five seconds, we draw a tangent to the graph at five seconds, like you can see there. And then what we do is we find the gradient of that tangent. There's another property we sometimes use called average speed, which is the total distance traveled divided by the time taken. Um, so let's actually have a look on the graph at how we calculate each of the two. So there's our tangent to the graph, so we can find speed at a point. Uh, and what we would do is we'd do the gradient of that tangent or delta d1. I'm going to call it a delta t1. If we want to find the average speed, we want to know the total distance we've traveled, which is the delta d2, and the time it's taken to travel that distance. So the average speed doesn't really care what it's done in between uh, those two points. It's just an indication of, on average, what's happened over this period of time. So they're subtly different things. Okay. So what we're going to start to talk about now is introduce some other properties of motion which are what we call vector quantities so let's start off by defining a few things so a scalar quantity is something that only has magnitude uh, so we don't care which direction or it doesn't even have direction it is so things like energy uh, things like speed distance all of those things we just give it a number we say 20 joules five meters uh, 20 miles per hour those are all scalars. A vector quantity has both magnitude and direction. So it'll be 20 meters to the left or those kind of things. So to introduce two vector quantities, because we haven't really met vector quantities before, um, most properties of motion that you've come across so far will have vector equivalents. So for distance, its vector equivalent is displacement, the distance traveled with a direction. And velocity is the vector equivalent of speed but we'll take a look at that in a second so for distance distance is a scalar uh, so some examples we might use we've got lots of different units we use for distance all of these would be equally scalars because there's no direction with them they're just numbers with units displacement would be a vector quantity so they'd have the distance so they've still got the magnitude but they also have a direction be it left east horizontally upwards even sometimes angles uh, as some way of describing which direction they are in okay so we can do the same thing with speed and velocity so speed is a scalar because we just give it a number like with meters per second or miles per hour velocity is very similar but again comes with direction. So it's 10 meters per second left, 20 miles per hour east. So they're a bit more detailed than just giving the speeds. Okay, so we can finish off looking uh, at speed by looking at actually describing different distance versus time graphs. So the first graph I describe is this one. So we can see the gradient or the slope of the graph is increasing over time. So that means the speed is increasing because remember we said the speed is the gradient. This red one shows constant speed because that gradient is a fixed value. So it's a fixed number. And this green line shows decreasing speed because the gradient is decreasing over time. Okay, so now we're going to move on to look at velocity versus time graphs, which means we're going to need to define some more concepts. So acceleration is what the rate of change of velocity. 
So um, that means the same way we did before, acceleration is the gradient of a velocity versus time graph. And all, very often we can calculate it from a, uh, the gradient of a speed versus time graph too. Whereas average velocity, just like before, is the total change in velocity divided by the total time taken. So it doesn't really care kind of what's happened in between two points, it just wants to know what on average is going on. We also have another term which we use quite a lot called deceleration. And all that really means is that the speed is decreasing. So if speed is decreasing, we express that as a positive deceleration. So it's decelerating at two meters per second squared. Um, but sometimes we also express decreasing speed as a negative acceleration. They are both essentially the same thing. So again, we can use graphs to figure out these two properties. So acceleration is going to be the green diagram. We've drawn our tangent. We've got change in velocity, change in time for that tangent. Whereas the average acceleration, again, we're going to just do the total change in velocity divided by the time taken to get that value. OK, so that's how we get acceleration from a velocity time graph. We can also find out how far an object has traveled from a velocity or speed versus time graph. So what we have to do is find the area under the graph between the times that we're interested in. And what that really means is when we say area under graph, the area between the, the line of the graph and the x axis. So for this graph, if we want to find out the distance traveled between one and three seconds, we try to find that area there. And that is at trapezium. So we can find the area of a trapezium by doing the average of the two sides and times by the base. And in this case, when I say v1, I mean the velocity at one second. And when I say v3, I mean the velocity at three seconds. Uh, so those essentially are measuring the two lengths of the sides of the trapezium. OK. So again, just like before, we can describe acceleration from a velocity or speed versus time graph. Uh, this one, the acceleration is clearly increasing. Uh, this one, the acceleration is constant, and this one, the acceleration is decreasing, but this is not deceleration. You can see the velocity is always increasing over this period of time, so it's still accelerating. Its acceleration is just decreasing, but that's not deceleration. Okay. So in order to cause the motion of an object to change, uh, we need to apply what we call a resultant force to it or an unbalanced force. So uh, there's a law that tells us about this and it's Newton's first law. So what he noticed is that the, an object's velocity, so both its magnitude and direction or its speed and direction, remains constant unless it experiences an unbalanced force, which we usually call a resultant force. So when we say resultant force, what does that mean? It's when we represent all of the forces on an object by one force that causes the same acceleration. So we've got two scenarios here. The diagram on the left, we've got no forces acting on it. And on the diagram on the right, we've got equal and opposite forces acting on either side. So as far as Newton is concerned, these two objects are actually the same because the resultant force is zero in both cases because the two hundreds cancel each other out to give you a resultant force of zero. So both of their velocities will not change, so they'll both keep traveling at five meters per second in the same direction they were before. The object on the right, however, may well experience a change in length or get compressed. That is possible. OK, so we can look at a few more scenarios. So in this one, there is an unbalanced force because there's just one force acting to the right. So that is going to accelerate and its speed is going to increase because the resultant force is parallel to the five meters per second. In this one at the bottom, we've still got a resultant force of 200, but the resultant force is in the opposite direction to velocity. So it's going to decrease in speed or it's going to decelerate. But again, his direction is not going to change.
Okay, so then finally, let's look at these two scenarios. So both of these scenarios are going to accelerate, and they're actually going to experience the same acceleration, because the resultant force on both objects is 200 newtons. On the left, that's easy to see. On the right, we can do 400 minus 200. That gives us a result of force of 200 as well. And it the resultant forces will both be in the same direction as the speed so the object's velocity is going to increase and they're going to experience actually the same acceleration now i want to put a proviso in this the reason their accelerations would be the same here is because the force is the same and the mass is the same you need both in order to conclude that um, if the mass of these objects were different they would still experience the same resultant force but the different masses would lead to different accelerations a bigger mass would lead to a smaller acceleration so let's talk a little bit now about forces that stop objects um, moving or, st or resist us trying to accelerate them or resist their travel. So there are two real forces that fit this category we're going to come across. There's dry friction, which we usually just call friction, and there's drag. You might come across things like air resistance and that kind of thing. So let's use dry friction, first of all, which we usually just call friction. Um, so this is caused due to the interlocking of surfaces. So you can see in the diagram, the surfaces of objects, even if they appear quite smooth, have these ridges, these like mountainous regions, and where those interlock, that leads to resistive forces when you try and slide them past one another, because those interlocking bits hit each other. So a key thing to know about dry friction is it always acts parallel to the contact surface. So if you're trying to slide something across a table, the frictional force will always act parallel to that table. So because of what friction is, there are ways of changing how big it is. So we have some objects we describe as smooth, and what we mean is surfaces uh, are smooth, have less interlocking, and therefore the force of friction is smaller. Whereas rougher surfaces have much bigger ridges and there's much more interlocking, and you get a much bigger force of dry friction. So that's one way we can change dry friction. We can also change dry friction by pushing objects together. So um, when we do that, we get what's called a normal force. So as we push two objects together, there are forces which resist you pushing them together that stop them going through each other. And we call those normal forces. And the larger the normal force is, that means you're going to end up with more interlock interlocking even because you've pushed them closer together and therefore you get a bigger force of dry friction. And you can see this for yourself. If you just push an object across a table, it should slide quite easily. If you push down on it and try and slide it, it's much harder to do. Okay, so the second resistive force I said we'd look at is drag. The most common type you come across is air resistance, uh, but you also get drag if you're trying to move through a liquid like water or anything else. So what this is in a nutshell is you colliding with particles of the medium. So if we're traveling through air, we'd say the medium is air. And the harder you collide with them and the more collisions you have per second, that's going to give you a larger drag force. So if we look at, again, some variables for that, if we increase the surface area of an object, hopefully it's logical that you're going to have more collisions with the medium particles every second, giving you a larger drag force. But also, if you're traveling faster relative to the medium, so let's imagine the air particles are stationary and we're trying to run through them at speed, the faster we travel, we're going to have harder collisions with that medium because uh, there's a bigger speed difference. And we're also going to have more collisions per second because we're moving faster. And those are both going to act to increase the drag force. And that's why it's really hard to travel at high speed because the drag force gets bigger and bigger and bigger the faster you try and travel. And that finishes this video looking at the kind of properties of motion and forces. And in the next video, we'll move on to look at the turning effects of forces. Thank you.